evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us on our weekly AJA Zoom event and welcome to any new people that might be watching us this week. We also have people watching on Facebook and some who listen to the audio replay, which is broadcast every Thursday at midday and Sundays at 4 p.m. on J Air Community Radio. That's at FM 88 in Melbourne or at j-air.com.au everywhere else. So welcome to you all. My name is Alan Friedman. I'm Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association and uh, MC for the evening, as usual. Um, also on your screen is David Adler, President of the AJA, and our guest tonight, David Lane, from the Israeli Cool Israel Advocacy website. The format will be pretty much as usual. We're going to have a, a chat slash interview with, uh, with David, and then we'll open it up to questions. And if you're not familiar with our system, if you do want to ask a question and uh, you're encouraged to do so, what we ask you to do is raise your hand electronically um, and that way that gets our attention. Uh, the way to do that is click on the reaction icon at the bottom of the screen and you'll see the little, the little picture to, uh, to click. You can write uh, written questions if you like. These can be put on the chat function. And Robert Gregory, our Director of Public Affairs, We'll read some of them out during question time. Okay, so as the saying goes, two Jews, three opinions. The Jewish world is never short of an opinion about something, and anybody who's, who has ever studied the Talmud will be familiar with the arguments amongst the sages over seemingly pedantic legalistic matters. And so it is with Israel's ongoing conflict with the Palestinian Arabs, or more correctly, their ongoing conflict with the Jews. There are a multitude of websites that contain all manner of geographical, historical, political and diplomatic information on the subject, and it's also spawned many dedicated websites, some of which, are, some of which have thrived, but also many which have faded away. One of the best ones aligned to our worldview was founded some years ago by expat Aussie David Lang, and he is the executive, executive director of the Israeli Cool Israel Advocacy website. To tell us all about his website, why he started it, and what he wants to achieve with it, David joins us now. David, good evening, our time, and welcome back to Oz, even if it's only via the AJA Zoom event. Uh, good day to everyone over there back in Oz. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Good. Thanks. Thanks, David. Let's just start by asking you a little about your background. Just tell us where you grew up and um, when you made Aaliyah and why. I grew up in uh, Perth, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, <laughs> and I, I made Aliyah in uh, November 2000, which was around the time of the second Intifada. That wasn't the plan, of course, but it wasn't going to stop me from making Aliyah. And so, yeah, I've been here for over 22 years now. Okay. Um, and so how and when did Israeli cool start? It started in around March of 2003. And I like to say it started almost by accident, meaning I didn't have in mind the purpose to create an Israel advocacy website. Back in 2003, I heard about a thing called blogging, which had just started up. And I thought, oh, this seems interesting. And uh, I have a bit of a writing bent. And I thought it might be nice to try to start writing. And if you look at my first ever post on Israeli Cool, it's about Shane Warne and the Australian cricket team. It has absolutely nothing to do with Israel. It was only after I discovered the power of writing something that would resonate with people around the world. That was the point in time when I realised, hey, I can actually do some good with this and not just have this website as some sort of cathartic outlet for myself. Right. And and were you, this was obviously a hobby uh, to start with. What what sort of work were you do, doing? So since I made Aliyah to Israel, I was working in high tech. I did that from November 2001 until about 2019 when I quit my job and to devote myself Ooh. to Israeli Cool, which isn't just a website anymore, by the way. It's, a, it's an actual non-profit. My main activity is, of course, the website, but I'm open to speaking engagements and bar mitzvahs and weddings. Okay, and um, and that that keeps you busy, presumably. It keeps me busy because, as you are fully aware, anti-Semitism and hatred of the Jewish state is not just still around; it's thriving. And as long as that's around, I'm going to be very busy as are you. 
Yes, yes. So, so what's it like running your website? What What's an average day for you? Well, if there is day, an average day. Well, I, should, I, I should point out that I, I'm a, a widower with five children. So, of course, my main priority um, is my family. So I spend a lot of time doing the, the single dad things, which I'm very proud of and, will, you know, is the best thing I can do. And by my average days, I get up in the morning, uh, pray, of course, and I get online with a coffee by my side. And I'm just raring to go. I scan the news and the, the social media feeds. And I'm looking for articles and reports in which I can add to the conversation sometime. Israeli Cool isn't just a mere reporting website. There's plenty of great reporting websites out there. I'm trying to find a, a twist, an angle or something, a scoop, something that others aren't talking about, or if they're talking about it, they're doing so in a different way. And my ultimate goal is really, besides, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to just preach to the choir of, you know, people like everyone here tonight, who I assume will more or less agree with what I'm doing. I'm really, my main goal here is to try to influence the people who are can be influenced, meaning the people who are intellectually honest or on the fence. And that's my main goal with it, with it. But of course, if I can empower people on our side with more information, with more facts, debunking of libels and the like, then, then so be it. That's also a worthwhile endeavour. And do you engage with um, the politicians and the mainstream media and, and those sorts of people? Or do you tend to, to sit on the side and, uh, and kibitz? <laughs> Do I engage with them? I'm, I'm, I'm open to engaging with whoever wants to engage. But, yeah, my main... And I, I, I will write about uh, the mainstream media a lot and, and politicians, uh, not necessarily in the positive light, because I'm shining a light on hypocrisy and anti-Semitism most of the time. Yes, yes. And are there any personal threats that, that come your way as a result of the work that you do? Absolutely. In fact, I uh, just coming into this call today, I received another um, defamation uh, threat, meaning someone was in, or at least implying that they, they want to sue me for something I just wrote uh, this morning. They didn't like me pointing out that what they said I found to be highly anti-Semitic. Um, over the years, I've also, when I worked in high tech, I had one particular anti-Semite try to get me fired from my job. Uh, contacting my bosses, um, lying about what I was actually doing. Of course, that didn't eventuate because I wasn't doing anything wrong. And of course, you get the death threats as well, which, you know, I live in Israel, so I feel less uh, uh, insecure about it. But, you know, it's not pleasant to have to deal with this on a constant basis, all for just standing up for your people. And do you know where these threats come from? Well, when the person is identified on social media with their real name, of yes, I know where they're coming from, but a lot of them are anonymous. Um, are they within Israel or, or from anywhere in the world? Anywhere in the world. The threat, for instance, that I just received today was from Australia. Really? Yes. Um, and was this a, a, a real person or was it, was it an anonymous one? Oh, no, this is a pretty well-known person in the Indigenous Australian community. And I pointed out something that they tweeted um, which was basically about um, Israel, implying that Israel is a settler colonialist endeavour. And I pointed out that that's highly anti-Semitic and they didn't like that at all. Right. So d does anything ever eventuate from these threats? Do you actually have to go to the to the stage of, of engaging lawyers and, and, and doing things like that? In one case, I had an um, ex-ABC journalist threatened to sue me and actually engage a lawyer. So I engaged my lawyer back in Perth, a good friend of mine as well. And I basically was able to swat that potential legal action away because I had nothing. I'm, I'm entitled to um, express my opinion online and I can back up my opinion. So I'm not too worried about it, but having to deal with these threats, it takes energy. It really takes a lot of energy. Uh, yes, yes. C can you tell us who that was? Uh, you probably know who it is, Janine Kalek, who I think has left Australia since then. She had posted oh. something along the lines when an Israeli Arab lady was murdered. I believe it was in Melbourne, if I'm not mistaken, a number of years ago. 
Um, Can't remember. It was actually an Israeli Arab woman that was murdered in somewhere in Australia. And Janine Kalek referred to her everywhere, in fact, on, in an online report as a Palestinian. Yeah. So I perhaps hyperbolically titled my post, you know, Janine Kalek wipes Israel off the map, which clearly was not suggesting that she actually, you know, detonated a bomb over Israel. I was making a point about how she was wiping us figuratively off the map, and she didn't like that, so she threatened to sue me. Right. And uh, what, what happened in the end? Well, as I said, I engaged my lawyer, and I threatened to actually counter sue. Um, she posted on her Twitter account the letter of her lawyer to me, which was implying that what I had done was defamatory. You can't do that. So I threatened to counter sue, and I said, you've got nothing. And... Um, yeah, she gave up on that. And I, I refused. She wanted me to retract and apologize. And I said, no way. I stand yeah. by each and every word. Yeah, well done. Have, have you had any any issues with any other people from Australia that we might have uh, we might know about? Well, there is someone else just from today. And I, I just don't want to mention any names just in case that's an but, issue. I don't know. I, no lawyers are being engaged yet. Right. Um, but I've, I've, I've written about it on israelipool.com. I'm not okay. sure how famous in Australia this person is, but they've got a, a blue check mark on Twitter, which means that they are pretty well known, I believe. And judging by the volume of nasty uh, um, invective my way, I would say that they've got a pretty large following. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's that could develop or it could just fade away. I, I, I will point out someone that you might know about, Roger Waters. He once, um, <laughs> my website came up on his radar and he called it something like an obscure... Uh, he called you an website. obscure extremist, an, an, an obscure yeah. extremist website. Yeah. <laughs> and I was pretty proud of that. I wore that like a badge of honour. But the reason that he did that was because Alan Parsons, who he was trying to convince to boycott Israel, actually, in response to that boycott call, brought up or, you know, he published, uh, retweeted and shared on social media one of my posts attacking Roger Waters. So that was like, one of the highlights of my blogging <laughs> career, shall I say. And uh, you've, got, you've got a few of these listed on your website. One of the other ones is from a, a guy called Ben Ehrenreich from the New York Times, who I, I haven't personally heard of, but he called you a right-wing blogger. What, 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 what's his story? Is he um, quite well-known? Um, around the, the around the the world media, I actually don't. Um, I don't know. So, uh, so I guess okay, he's not that well known. He hasn't been on my radar for a long time. I, I take your word that that's on my site as a quote. But I don't yes. actually follow him too much. He's not one of the the more well known established names that I'm aware of. Yeah, and you, you've also had quite a lot of compliments uh, on on the work that you do. I saw that Fleur Hassan Hum. Um, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. We've had her as a guest on our Zooms, and she's she's a very uh, a very lively lady. She called you the king of Hasbara. Um, how, how do these how do these complimentary um, um, quotes uh, arrive? Do, do, they, do they, they don't post them directly on your website, do they? No. So in that particular case, I believe that might have just been a tweet. Okay. So for whatever reason, maybe liking something that I've written, and I'll take it for to put on my website because you know, as a non-profit, I do need some uh, positive uh, PR, as it were. Um, other times, I might ask someone. Um, for instance, at Fleur, I've done, I'm, I'm running a fundraiser, interview fundraiser, as many organisations are. So I actually asked Fleur, who's a friend of mine, if she could do a, a, a short video, which she did. So that was a case where I actually. Uh, asked her to do so, but I believe yes. the thing that you quoted was um, unsolicited, shall we say. Yeah, she was fantastic. She really stood up and uh, she's a terrific advocate, isn't she? Um, she's an amazing person, advocate and woman, absolutely. Yes. Um, and you got to, you got a, a little line of congratulations from Danny Ayalon, the former Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister and Israeli Ambassador to the US. Um, do, do you recall anything about that? Yes, if I remember correctly, there was a video that came out perhaps over a decade ago, I'm thinking, by a couple of Palestinian Arab uh, propagandists. And I think they were, if I'm not mistaken, again, I have to go back a bit, but it might have been about the so-called occupied territories, i.e. Judea and Samaria. And I basically debunked that on my website, um, you know, 
frame by frame, a, a real um, debunking, a comprehensive debunking. And Danny, that came to Danny Ayalon's attention. And then he, he did a video, published a video based on what I had written. Ah, now I remember. What they had done is they responded to a video of Danny Ayalon. So they rebutted or tried to rebut him. And then he mm. used my video to rebut their rebuttal. That's what it was. Okay. Yes. No. That's very good. Now, now you also have a page, a page for quote, anti-Zionist, not anti-Semite of the day, um, and unfortunately, you're never really short of a candidate. Do, do you ever get any reaction from the people you name and shame this way? Absolutely, I get a reaction. A number of different reactions. I'll tell you about some of them because they're pretty interesting. Yeah. The usual reaction will be they're highly offended and they'll want to sue me or they'll attack me, which is interesting because I'm pointing out their views. Most of these posts are basically screenshots of what they themselves have said. And what I'm trying to do, maybe it's obvious from the title, but just to explain in case it isn't, is I'm trying, my, one of the main purposes of this series of posts is to show how people that claim they're only being critical of Israel or they're only anti-Zionist, I will show how what they're actually posting is actually anti-Semitic, obviously anti-Semitic. We're talking about the, the Sturmer-style cartoons of Jews with big noses, anti-Semitic tropes, things that most people, most reasonable people will see as being anti-Semitic. So that's the, the main point of these posts. And another uh, purpose behind them is to basically, um, hopefully, create adverse consequences for these people. I'm not into cancelling people per se. I believe one of the most effective tools that we have is to hoist the, these anti-Semites on their own petard, use their own words against them. So I don't like to actually close down their accounts unless they're full-on inciting violence and murder against Jews. I prefer to let them spout this stuff. and then. But we have free speech as well. Yes. We're allowed to, to, to have our say and point out what they're saying. That's that's at least my point of view. You can argue against it, but that's that I find that highly effective. So, so back to your your question. So yeah, a lot of these people, I, I thought they should be proud of what they're saying, but they, mm. they deny it. I had one professor at Rutgers University who I exposed, and actually made the news over in the states. Um, he claimed that I hacked his account and made him look fatter than he really is, and that he hadn't been saying anything. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Michael Jakindis was his name. Uh, so I've been accused of hacking people. It wasn't really me or someone hacked my account. They come up with a whole litany of excuses. So they're not really proud anti-Semites, are they? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I mean, it would be nice to think that you actually um, get, get some of them to well, maybe not change their mind, but even stop and think about things. A little bit. Uh, do, do you have any any um, evidence that that people do stop and think about what they've been saying as a result of all this exposure? Believe it or not, that's happened before. And one's an Australian guy. Um, it's happened twice before. So I don't aim to do that because I know that these people are usually diehard anti-Semites, and I'm really doing this for the purpose of the people on the fence to see what nasty individuals these people are. It's not really to convince them of the error of their ways. But it is to deter people from doing such things because there will be adverse consequences, legal consequences. I'm not talking about uh, anything illegal or violent. I'm, that's not what I'm about, of course. Yes. So one guy contacted me, I think it was last year, and he'd written something against Josh Friedenberg, who you're all very familiar with, of course. And he, he invoked some anti-Semitic stereotypes to do with Jews and money about Josh. And I pointed that out. I'm not going to mention his name, but he reached out to me many years afterwards. And he said, listen, I'm so sorry. And um, I was really angry about some policy, I guess, or something Josh had done or, or the Liberal Party had done. And he said he was reacting to his anger, but he knows it was wrong. And he tried to contact members of the Jewish community and he was rebuffed and he, he wanted to reach out to me. He didn't ask me to take down the post or anything like that, but I wanted to see if he was actually genuine. And he seemed pretty genuine just from his emails, but I'm, I've been around, you know, this isn't my first rodeo. I wanted to see for sure. So I had a Zoom meeting with him and he was crying. And I, in my opinion, thought he was very, and again, he wasn't asking me to take down anything. 
He said he'd moved to the States. So he left Australia. He had to kind of start from scratch again. But this was weighing heavily on his mind. And he wanted to reach out to some rabbi in Australia. I forget the name of the rabbi. It doesn't matter. And, you know, express his contrition. And I, I, I accepted that as I told him about the, the Jewish concept of tshuva and how it, it seemed this was a real repentance. And um, so that, that, that kind of gives me some, some hope. And there was one other person in the States that also expressed contrition and um, took down their posts and issued an apology on their Facebook page for their previous uh, anti-Semitic posting. So, yeah, let's be honest. It, it will happen very rarely, but even if you can change one mind... Yeah. It's worth uh, it. Yes, absolutely. Now, I saw on your your page you have a, a an Australian there, a lady by the name of name of Belinda McLaughlin from Caboolture in Queensland, that that I suspect none of us have ever heard of. Um, what can you tell us about that uh, that story? Well, I hadn't heard of her either. She's just a regular, you know, person. I found her because what one of the ways that I identify these anti-Zionists, not anti-Semites, is I look at the, the anti-Semitic Facebook pages. And one of the most prominent ones is one called Cod's News Network. They're Hamas affiliated. And they're constantly demonizing not just Israel, but you know, they're going beyond the pale. Um, and you know, they'll do they'll do things like post videos of what they call Talmudic rit Jews doing Talmudic rituals, which is just for storming the Temple Mount, which is just a bunch of Jewish people walking quietly up there. Just to give you an idea of the sorts of things they're posting. So this Belinda uh, McLaughlin, she posted some things on there, but I noticed I don't just go after people that are anti-Israel. I'm looking for the people that they're showing the in the anti-Semites. That that's the whole point. So she was writing things to all sorts of posts, many that were mourning actual terrorists that were killed, not innocent Palestinian Arabs, but actual terrorists that were killed battling us, you know, fighting against us or trying to perpetrate uh, terrorist attacks. And she kept mentioning the chosen ones. Oh, look, the chosen ones, which is obviously a dig at the Jewish people as the chosen people. I think we can all agree that that's not anti-Zionism, that's Yes. That's anti-Semitism. And that's one of the dog whistles. So as I do, I looked into her Facebook page and she didn't just stop there. She'd posted, and this is around the time of you know Kanye West coming out with everything. And we all know about Farrakhan and um, anti-Semitism from members of the African American community, some members. So she she had also posted a video to do with Farrakhan. And this is, again, not about anti-Zionism. This is full, unabated anti-Semitism. So it's not that this person, I don't just write about well-known people. I go, you know, I'm an equal opportunity offender. If you're an anti-Semite, game on. Yeah, and, and do you contact, would you contact her and let her know that you've exposed her in this way? Uh, not necessarily. Um, if they have a social media presence, Usually on Twitter, I'll, I will tag them. I'm not hiding what I'm doing. But, you know, usually one someone might post something on their Facebook wall. I think someone did contact her because she removed the video. But, again, this isn't my first rodeo, so I usually take screenshots as well in case mm -hmm. they remove the posts. Yeah. Uh, um, on the history tab of your site, you dig a little deeper than most to get to the truth. Uh, for example, there's one, one, uh, one page that says... Did Golda Meir really say there are no Palestinians? Because that's that's what that's what people like to quote. And we love this because one of our driving principles is to simply tell the truth about the Middle East. Um, do you think that the truth is finally starting to 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 emerge from this fog of Palestinian narrative that we always hear about? I think, unfortunately not probably to the right people. We, especially in the age of social media, there tend to be these echo chambers and there's a lot of confirmation bias and people will sort of stick, they've got their, their predetermined ideas and thoughts. And many people, especially those who already hate Israel, and again, many of the, or if not most of the people that hate Israel are actually anti-Semitic. Let's be clear about that. There are some people who are ignorant. So I'm, with my website and some other websites out there, we, we, we publish such posts in order to try to influence the intellectually honest people. 
That's what I was saying a few minutes ago about I'm targeting intellectually honest. But if you're not intellectually honest, like so many of the haters, you're not really coming through to them, are you? You're not really getting no. through. So I'm just stating it as it is. I would love to say the truth is emerging from the fog. If it is emerging, it's little snippets of truth to certain types of people. But the mass of people, unfortunately, are being brainwashed. And that's because when you have celebrities, people, role models, sporting personalities, um, you see the World Cup, teams that are raising the Palestinian flag, when all they're being inundated with this, especially the young people who I fear for, they're going to lean towards the anti-Israel narrative, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, the, the, the World Cup and some of the, the Palestinian um, blogs and websites, do, do you follow those at all? Because I, I follow a couple of them on Facebook and I, I keep poking, you know, a bit poking fun at them and saying, all you can ever do is wave, wave flags around because they seem to do it a lot. Um, um, what what um, Do you follow those, those pro-Palestinian websites at all? Oh, Absolutely. I, I do. I get a lot of grist for my meal for my meal following these websites because besides debunking libels, which is very important, one of my philosophies or a main driving force rather behind Israel, Israeli cool, Israel advocacy is to be proactive and to go yes. on the attack. And rather than just, for instance, react to a particular libel that comes our way, which I do do, by the way, I then I'm, I'm, I try to do more than that. I try to poke holes in the credibility of these people. And that can be done by either showing the anti-Semitic, as I mentioned, or in many cases, to show how they're lying all the time. And they do lie, as you know, and they will have, yes. uh, you know, what I call photography, F-A-U-X, photography. Yes. <laughs> they use a photo from somewhere else, or they Photoshop something on somebody. Um, they constantly lie. And that's, again, this is why I'm against censorship, because I believe one of our best weapons are themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Their bad behavior, their dishonesty are one of the best weapons. They're a gift to us, believe me. Yes. I was actually interested. The video that was doing the round over the last few days was that uh, the Jewish doctor being interviewed on French TV. And he wears a kippah and he got challenged by the interviewers on this. And uh, it was quite, quite amazing. Um, what did you think when you saw that? Yeah, I did actually cover this on my website. Um, unpopular view, perhaps, but I didn't actually call it anti-Semitic. It was vile, mm. disgusting, but the reason I didn't call it anti-Semitic was because France are known for this against all religions, really. They've got bans in schools on head coverings, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, face veils in public. So, and that's a, a Muslim thing. So, yes. but we're looking at it, it was, I felt very uneasy. It was almost like Nazi Germany esque mm. watching this Jewish person being attacked. But what I, and I wrote about this, perhaps the most disgusting thing about that whole display was that the woman sitting next to him who was criticizing him, saying, Don't you know you can't do this? What are you doing? She happens to be a Jewish journalist. Yes. yes. So you had that added component of the, the, what seemingly is a non proud Jew castigating a proud Jewish person, um, which really made me physically sick, to be honest. Yes, it was very disturbing. Um, uh, I'm going to hand over to David in just a moment um, to uh, give us a little update on what's coming uh, because I'm uh, well, we're going to open up for question time. Now, I deliberately didn't touch on any of the the uh, the big issues of uh, of the of Israel advocacy because I figure that the audience will probably want to ask you about those. So um, now's the time. I can already see a few hands up. So if you're listening on J-Air, I will just mention this is the Australian Jewish Association Zoom event, which we have every Wednesday night. Our guest tonight is David Lang, who is the executive director of the Israeli Cool uh, website. And we're chatting to him about some of the, uh, the good work that he does. I'll just hand over to our David for a minute to uh, give us an update on what's coming up and what's going on, and then we'll throw it open to questions from the audience. Thanks, David. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. How as we do each week, uh, we need everyone who's listening after this event to do something to support uh, AJA. If you're not yet a member, uh, when we're finished this evening, 
go to the website, jewishassociation.org.au, where you can take membership for just $40 a year or $180 for five years. Join the email list, which is very important. Um, you can also make a donation on the um, website. Uh, we have recently uh, launched uh, AJ8 Sadaka, which is our special charity arm for fighting anti-Semitism as its primary objective, and donations to AJ8 Sadaka are fully tax deductible in Australia. Uh, next week, um, we're going to actually do what a lot of organisations do because it'll be our last uh, event of the year. And that is, uh, have a look at some of the key issues of 2022 that we've been tackling and consider some of the issues that we might have to tackle in 2023. And I've just listed a few of those uh, here um, that we might touch on, anti-Semitism and the IRA definition, uh, the impact of the new federal label government, particularly on Israel policy, uh, Alan's done a lot of work on cancel culture in the Jewish community. Um, we've made presentations to government. Uh, Robert Gregory has recently done a major presentation to the Senate on uh, Iran. Uh, we've hosted ambassadors and developing relations with some important countries. Um, the work of AJ8 Sadaka we need to talk about, particularly our success in helping the boys involved in the big anti-Semitic case in uh, uh, Melbourne, uh, alleging long uh, systematic uh, anti-Semitism. Um, we might discuss the new Israel government and there'll be an open forum for views. So it should be a really interesting and a bit of a different evening. Thanks, David. And just before we do go to questions, um, I want to ask uh, David Lang that the number 18 is the focus of a campaign you have launched. So just before we get to questions, please tell us what this is about. Okay, so Israel, um, Israeli Cool Israel Advocacy being a non-profit, I joined the uh, list of non-profits out there with their end-of-year fundraising. Um, I launched this around uh, Giving Tuesday, which is the end of November, and since then, um, I received a generous offer from one of uh, my main donors or our main donors to match the next 18,000 US dollars, I should point out, not Australian, US dollars, um, will be matched by them. And it, it's, it's nice in the sense that, you know, being an observant Jewish person as I am, the number 18 is very significant in Judaism and it's, uh, it means life, l'chaim, as you're aware. And it sort of breathed life in life into my end of year campaign. And what I'm trying to do with Israeli Cool, if it wasn't already clear, it's a one man operation at the moment. You keep mentioning the the blog, and yeah, it started through the Israeli Cool blog. And I'm the only real person blogging at the moment. I have the occasional guest post. But what I really want to do with Israeli Cool is make more of an impact. And to make more of an impact, I need to produce, or we need to produce more content not just um, written content, but videos, um, you know, do some of the, the, the amazing things that your organization is doing, have sessions like this. I just simply don't have the bandwidth or time to do so. So I really, really want to be able to bring in more people, more talented people, not just anyone, but handpicked people in the Israel advocacy space who I believe are making a difference, who have the ability to, to get beyond the choir and actually influence hearts and minds out there. And um, that's the 18 campaign, 18,000, uh, so to get as many donations as possible, but the next $18,000 will be matched. And I, obviously I made it until the 18th of December, because why not? 18 okay. by 18. Okay, so I've put the uh, the web address, the web, the address of your website on the chat function. So people, uh, please, please go to David's website. We need, we need people like him doing what he does uh, because it all makes a difference. So so if people can visit that website and do what you can. Okay, it's over to you. I've got Michael, Anne and Jeff and Saul. So Michael, uh, we'll start with you. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi, David. Welcome from sunny Thailand. Um, we've got, can you hear me? I do, love them. Yep. Yeah, um, we've got a problem with um, 
uh, Jewish anti-Zionists, as you're probably aware. I mean, just recently, uh, one of the JCCV affiliates, Australian Jewish Democratic Society, wrote a, a, an article in the ABC website uh, calling Israel an apartheid state, etc. Um, you mentioned you had a lot of critics. Do you get do you get critics from the progressive left, whether it be from the New Israel Fund, J Street, or these other uh, Jewish Israel haters? Absolutely, Michael. In fact, the what happened today, which I described before about writing about this person that had, had uh, defamed us, um, many of the responses I'm getting on Twitter are from people that are saying, as a Jew, yes. what you're saying is the family. Yeah. As a Jew, I didn't find any offence to that. To which I respond to these people, don't as a Jew me, okay, I'm a proud Jewish person. The vast majority of people, 90, at least 95% of Jews have a connection to Israel, are proud of, the, of that connection. So just because there's a nutty minority of Jews that will throw Israel under the bus, that doesn't work on me. It doesn't work on us. Many of the actual anti-Semites are being emboldened by these Jewish people. You look at the Democratic, for instance, the Democratic Party in America. You have Ilan Omar, Omar Rashida Tlaib, the squad. They're very much emboldened by actual Jewish people, that um, the, the sorts that you just described, Michael. And it's a very big problem. And um, I actually was at an anti-Semitism conference in Jerusalem a number of months ago. It was on, uh, as I mentioned, anti-Semitism. And Deborah Lipstadt was talking. She was one of the main... Uh, speakers there. And I asked this very question to her in the question and answer period um, at the end of the discussion. You know, how do we deal with this? This is actually one of the main challenges that we have fighting anti-Semitism. Because when you have Jewish people saying that's not anti-Semitic, Jewish people that are in a way uh, alibis for anti-Semites, look, some of my best friends are Jewish. We all know about that refrain. These are the best friends they're talking about. And it's a big, big issue. And Deborah Lipstadt said to me, that's a very good question. She didn't really have an answer. She's like, yeah, we have to find a way to deal with this. Yeah. Uh, what do you think when you look uh, across the waters and see the, the diaspora community in, in say, the US, um, it really, it's, it's really becoming, um, uh, Israel just does not seem to focus uh, on their radar as much as, as it did perhaps with their parents and grandparents. Does that worry you? Oh, it absolutely worries me. This, I believe, is the result of, especially in the US, the education system over there. Um, the universities are hotbeds for anti-Israel sentiment and even anti-Semitism. Jewish students are feeling incredibly unsafe. But I will note what I saw now in Australia, so I'm following the news in Australia, what just hap has happened with these BDS motions at the University of Sydney and Melbourne what we saw just now at the University of Adelaide mm. with this uh, Habiba Jaguri and the Death to Israel article and everything around that, which I was sort of involved with behind the scenes. So none of us are immune. Australia, I remember Australia is a tolerant society. I never left Australia because of any anti-Semitism that I experienced. I had a great childhood. and um, But I'm worried. I'm yes. very, very worried. Yes. I have actually a friend that isn't so worried because he's sort of a fatalist. He's like, this is God's way of uh, getting all the Jews to Israel. But of course, we need to be worried. <laughs> Take it or leave it. We still need to be worried, even if you have that point of view, for, for our safety. And not just that, our, our children's future and the future of Judaism in the diaspora. Yes, for sure. Okay, Anne, your turn. Please unmute yourself. Thank you, David. Another good get, Alan and, and David. Love it. Um, David, do you consider that you use both the softly, softly approach and a blunt approach in the way you uh, write and, and the approach you use with your website? I'm curious, um, Anne, where's the softly, so where do you see the softly, <laughs> well, I mean, softly, softly? I mean, in other words, sometimes you can use gentle language but you're dealing with things and other times it's kapow I'm, I'm going to get you back yeah now that's a good question i I'm, I'm just being a bit silly actually what i try to use humor a lot 
we, we, we maybe didn't discuss it. It seems you might, if you're just tuning in or you've just been watching this, you might think um, it's all doom and gloom with me and I fight anti-Semitism and boom, 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 the, the hard approach. But actually, I really enjoy using humor, Aussie humor, I, I could put it that way. So a lot of what I write about, even though they're serious topics, I try to inject the humor. So I, you could call that a bit softly, softly, because there's people. it sort of produces this reaction in people, maybe some sort of cognitive dissonance whereby they're, you're making it palatable for them, what they're reading, but actually what they're reading is very disturbing. And for instance, if you take the anti-Zionist, not anti-Semite series, if you read some of those posts, I do, I'm pretty sarcastic, and I, I try to inject a bit of humour and sarcasm. In, in fact, it's almost like I'm mocking these people, mm -hmm. kind of making them, in a way, I guess, seem less dangerous. But I, in, in my mind, what I'm doing is I'm trying to take away, I, I believe they hate it. They hate being mocked and not taken. I mean, we are taking what they say seriously, but I'm kind of reducing them. I'm reducing yeah. them to, to lower type of person. So um, I hope that answers your question. I do see yeah. that there is a effective, it is effective, or at least I think it's effective to, yes, to, to go hard and, and at, at the bad guys, but at the same time, use things like humor and, and, and those sorts of things in order to engage people and make it, uh, an interesting, engaging website. David, do you ever take aim at, at some of the Jewish organisations? I, I mean, it's not quite the same as, as us in the diaspora here. We, we go pretty hard against some of our local communal organisations because we just don't think that they're, they're standing up strongly enough for Israel. And we get accused of being divisive and destructive and why do you always have to complain about things? Um, does that is that something that you 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 find in your activities? I re I really do. I'd say the main focus are organisations in the United States like J Street, mm. um, Jewish Voice for Peace, which I don't really call a Jewish organisation, wow. um, and these sorts that you're probably all familiar with. But I did actually recently. I wouldn't say I attacked, but when you had this uh, the BDS motion. Uh, contra controversies in the, in Australia recently, I actually did criticise the statements that were coming out from those organisations. Because when I looked at the, the motions that were put forward by those universities, they were actually, it wasn't just that they were anti-Semitic, which all the major organisations were saying, which is fine, and I agree with that. But they all seemed to miss the point. And if I'm not mistaken, you guys, the AJA did point this out. They were, these motions were legitimising terrorism. And so mm, they buried the absolutely. List. That was the most worrying thing for me. That was the most worrying thing. So I, I, I'm not averse to criticizing um, organizations that aren't doing their job. The ADL, I, I can't believe I didn't mention them. They're, they're, yeah. they're a big offender. They're a huge offender. They're very divisive. And what they're doing now is very counterproductive. Yeah, but they will turn it around. They'll say, you, you are being divisive. I mean, this is what those left-wing organizations do, isn't it? They absolutely, they'll say you're being extremist or divisive. Yes. But what we're doing, it was we're not being hypocritical. We're not partisan, meaning we'll call it out wherever the anti-Semitism is. Left, right, centre, black, white, grey, doesn't Jewish. matter. Yeah. It is. And a lot yeah. of these organisations, for whatever reason, either they have a political agenda or they're somehow scared because of donor money. They don't want to offend anyone. Uh, the, the the advantage of Israeli Cool is being a small organisation. I'm not beholden to any donors, um, and I can say it as it is. Okay, uh, Jeff, your turn. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Shalom, David. Can you hear me? <laughs> Loud and clear. Uh, you mentioned uh, debunking libels and uh, all that and they lie all the time, which should make it easier for you to sue them. And the, their dishonesty is the best weapon, and I only quote you. So why don't you get friendly with your lawyer and start suing some of these people, or get friendly with Shurat Hadin and do much, do much the same. And one other thing, uh, the term anti-Semite or anti-Semites comes from an anti-Semite himself from the last uh, two centuries ago, actually. So why don't you use Jew haters instead? That's it. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll, I'll answer the, the both questions. When I mention libels, I mean libels against Jews as a whole. I know, in the I, Jews know I know, I know. So organizations like Shurata Din, as you mentioned, there are others, lawfare organizations, they're the ones that deal with that, but you're absolutely right. Of course, if I'm attacked personally, I would definitely weigh my options. Um, but I usually don't because it's 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 very hard to sue for libel, especially uh, you know ju jurisdictional issues and the like, and money issues. Um, regarding your second point, just remind me um, uh, the terminology. Does it make any difference whether we call them anti-Semites or Jew haters? Point. So I do mention Jew hatred, but I do sprinkle in anti-Semite as well, just because people are familiar with that. But it's an absolutely valid point, and it, you're right because. A lot of the anti Jew haters, okay, a lot of the Jew haters, one of their responses are, wait a minute, where are the Semites? Yeah. So you, it's a very it's a very valid point. Um, but because I'm thinking about my audience, I mean, I, I, so I do a bit of both. You are right. It's probably better to avoid the term anti-Semite um, overall, but I think it just takes a bit of time to ingrain that in people's uh, consciousness. But I, I, I take your point. It's a, it's a very valid point. Okay. Um, Saul, your turn. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for a most interesting and illuminating talk. We can all agree, I think, that anti-Semitism is increasing. And do you have the problem, because it's increasing, that now some people feel they no, need, no longer need be ashamed of being exposed as anti-Semites? And so when you expose them, what do they do? They would say, yes, I am anti-Semitic and I'm proud of it because that is the correct policy. And what you have done is actually seen the correct policy by calling me an anti-Semite. Thank you. How do you deal with that kind of problem? Do you have it at all? As I mentioned before, I don't, I've never seen that. When I expose these people, they're, they're getting offended that they're being called an anti-Semite. But you're right that people are more blatant in the anti-Semitism. They just don't like to be called an anti-Semite, unless you have someone like Kanye West or someone that is just completely off the dial at the moment and um, doesn't seem to really care if people call him an anti-Semite. And he tends to point to them saying, see, they are trying to silence me. Mm. So I haven't really experienced that. Uh, when people say I'm a proud anti-Semite, but again, if they do something like that, again, I'm, I'm I'm looking at what this person will be perceived as to the regular, reasonable person. They're the ones I'm trying to influence with what I'm doing, um, especially college students and the, the younger generation who are being brainwashed by um, you know anti-Israel sentiment and the like. Yeah, I suppose Saul was probably alluding to the fact that anti-Semitism is becoming more mainstream. This is really the, the problem. Um, but the, but the, the, the Kanye West thing was was bizarre, wasn't it? I mean, he, he, got, ac he got accused of, of making some anti-Semitic statements and then doubled down and actually made it worse. Um, did, how do you see all of that? You yeah, know, that's exactly, I think he believes he's beyond reproach. He is so rich and he's such a following. And he's obviously, there's a lot of frustration there, perhaps with some personal experiences he had with some Jewish people. But obviously what he's saying is completely anti-Semitic and wrong. And the fact that he's doubling down, perhaps it's ego. Uh, if you ask Ben Shapiro, he'll tell you that there's definitely mental illness. I, I don't like to go in the mental illness direction. Perhaps no. it's true, but it's it almost implies that there's some sort of mitigating circumstance. You could argue every anti-Semite has a mental illness. You could argue that. Mm -hmm. the mental illness is anti-Semitism, is hatred of irrational hatred of Jewish people. But it doesn't, I don't think, help us to mitigate, in a sense, their Jew hatred. Um, you have to call it out, whoever the person is, whatever the situation is. Yeah. And um, Kanye West has been given many, many opportunities to walk back. And as you mentioned, it's it's kind of crazy. He just keeps digging himself a bigger well, hole at this point. Yeah, well, he, he says he, he admires Hitler, and it just kept getting worse and worse, didn't it? So it's it's, it's quite bizarre. Okay. Uh, Robert is our Director of Public Affairs. Uh, Robert, have you got some written questions you want to uh, put to David? Uh, 
Yeah, thanks, David. Um, just a couple of questions came through. So how do you assess um, whether your efforts are succeeding in going beyond preaching to the converted? So you mentioned um, that some of the some of the actual, a couple of anti-Semites um, changed their opinion. How else do you measure it? And the other question is, um, what, are you, what are your thoughts on changes to Twitter since Elon Musk um, purchased that? Have you noticed any difference? Do you predict any anything will change? Okay, regarding the first question, how do I know I'm preaching beyond the choir? This isn't something you can look at Google Analytics and have stats, but I can say based on feedback I've received over the years. And I'll give you some examples just to give you an idea. One example that springs to mind is a number, many, many years ago, I had a Wikipedia page, Israeli called Wikipedia page, which was since taken down. They claimed it was not notable enough, the website. But if you look at the discussions, uh, the people behind that move were very anti-Israel. Okay, I won't go into that. The reason I'm mentioning this is that the person, I, I didn't create the Wikipedia page. Who created it? And this would have been in about 2011. Before the Abraham Accords, it was a, a woman, a female Muslim Arab pro-Palestinian person, okay, a pro-Palestinian pro woman, that back in the day I had a podcast and she, she liked the podcast. It gave her a different point of view. As I mentioned before, she um, I, I like to use humor. So she liked my humor. She liked the Australian way I, I went about my things. So she could kind of relate to me as a person. And so she was able to become, a, she became a fan of the site to a point where she created unsolicited a Wikipedia page dedicated to Israeli cool. Not only that, she invited me onto her website she had started about Middle Eastern voices or something along those lines, a now defunct website. And she would republish some of my posts to give the other point of view. This woman never became pro-Israel. She was still more on the pro-Palestinian side of things, but she, I, was able to, um, I was able to appeal to her in a way that she was willing to amplify my voice. So that's, what, that's one example. Another example, I guess it's a bit of a similar example in the sense that it was another Arab Muslim, a friend of mine from Dubai, who, I met him on Twitter over a decade ago. And even before the Abraham Accords, we were in constant talk. And at a calculus uh, conference uh, about a year or two ago, on stage, he was being interviewed because he's quite a well-known um, Emirati businessman. He name-dropped Israeli cool, and he spoke about how Israeli cool, he used to you know, be anti-Zionist, and he now, he basically was saying that Zionism is such a demonized word. He, he was coming out with great talking points, which I was very proud of. Again, not unsolicited, but he mentioned how Israeli call had helped him and our friendship had helped him um, reach that point. So it's more these um, personal experiences. Oh, just one more that comes to mind because it's also Australian related. Just a Syrian refugee who lives now in Sydney sent me an email a couple of days ago, and I actually just published it on his website, on my website, with his permission, where he's reaching out to the Jewish community. He wants to talk, be able to talk to, to Jews living in Sydney, where he lives, because he realizes that his background was all about Jew, Jewish people being demonized, and he sees it's wrong. But he reached out to me, he's familiar with Israeli cool, and he thought that I would be someone that would be able to help him. So they're just three examples how I believe Israeli cool is reaching beyond the choir. Yeah, well, we may be able to help in that regard too, perhaps uh, by working together. Um, uh, Leon, uh, your turn. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, uh, David, uh, first of all, congratulations and uh, uh, more strength to you on the work that you do. I've just got a small point to make as a marginal point in connection with semantics. Uh, nowadays, the suffix phobia has become very trendy. Why don't we harness this and use the term judeophobia, which will also combat those smart alecks who say Arabs can't be anti Semites, they're Semites. No, they're judeo, or well, some of them, judeophobes. Okay. This is kind of related to the previous question. I, I actually prefer Jew hatred, which was suggested before. This phobia sort of implies a fear of, and I don't believe these people fear, or perhaps they do fear us if you want to be, you know, psychologically look behind it all. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist, but I prefer Jew hatred, but I think it's the same point, meaning you have to mention the word Jew and some sort of adverse reaction to us as Jewish people. 
So I, I, I do take that point on board as well. Yeah. Um, can I, can yeah. I just uh, jump in, Alan? Yeah, sure. There is a, uh, a technical difference between anti-semite and anti-semite one word. And if you look at the organisation which writes the uh, most accepted definition, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, they've actually got a whole piece on the difference in, in writing the term and they believe that the correct way is without the hyphen. Um, so that that is uh, the standard that goes with the IHRA mm. definition. So from a technical point of view, if we do use the term um, anti-Semitism or anti-Semite, drop the hyphen because it then does open to the criticism against Semites. It's not that. It's a different word that has a different meaning. Yes, and the the the, the term anti-Semitism had really was never invented to talk about Semites. Correct. It was invented to talk about Jews. So that's that's a good point. Um, just before we, we we wrap it up, David, um, just give us a little bit of an update on the uh, on how uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is going with with forming his government, and and what thoughts do you have about uh, the incoming government, including people like. Uh, Itamar uh, Ben Gavir and Bezalel Smotrich. I will have to admit first and foremost that if you look at my website and what I write, I tend to stay away from internal Israeli politics, and that's okay. uh, a deliberate thing because again, I'm trying to to make a difference, and you don't want to put too many people uh, offside. Of course, I have my own personal points of view, and I do tread some of these waters occasionally. But first and foremost, I want to make this point, that the very people who are criticising um, these inclusions in the government, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, they're the sort of same voices that when Hamas were voted as uh, the government in Gaza were, were, and uh, were being criticised for their terrorism and all sorts of things, these are the sorts of people that were saying, but wait, they're democr democratically elected government. Yes. We should respect that. But these very same people are the ones that are saying, look at Israeli society, apartheid, racism, all these sorts of things, which is obviously not true. And I'm, I wouldn't attribute it to those individuals either. But that's one point I would take out of this. And one thing that we should be raising at the top of our voices. These people, yeah. they're not really about love of Palestine. Let's be clear about it. They're about hatred of the Jewish state. Yeah, absolutely. One example, the litany of examples we can point to. So I, don't, I wouldn't be on the defence about this. I know that your question wasn't uh, implying that, but just a no. general point, if you raised it, it's very important that we're not. This is a democratically elected government. Not just that, another point I want to raise. Why did they even get in? It's because most Israelis, we feel our security hasn't been looked after. We've been making concession after concession, and all we get is terror upon terror upon terror. So this is a natural, um, and you know, we had a government before, which was, let's say, more center, left center. And we had a government that included some of the Arab parties, which is another example of how we're not, you know, apartheid Israel accusation is ridiculous. Mm, so yeah. This is also something that needs to bear in mind that they were elected by the Israeli people for a reason. And not because of marginal issues that maybe they stand for that not all of us necessarily agree with social issues or the like but for their stand stand as as you know for proud jews living in our homeland and and strong on security and this is why uh, benjamin netanyahu got back he's been very criticized by many people for a variety of reasons uh, again i'm not going to go into, into yes. the politics my um, own personal views no. but the reason he was elected and he's perceived as a strong leader for israel yeah. Just one more, one more question, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. And and, and it's a bit aligned to that because um, all of our communal organisations in this country um, are absolutely wedded to the two-state solution. That's all we ever hear about from our communal organisations. Um, we we take a different view. Um, we take the view that that's not the one and only answer. We don't know what the answer is, but what we're saying is that. Uh, there should at least be a discussion about the various alternatives that are out there. Um, uh, that's probably not, well, I don't know. What 
what advice would you have for us, if if I can ask that? Um, how do you deal with people that only want to talk about the two state solution? I don't really have a problem with people wanting to talk about the two state solution, but of course I would point out and do point out why I don't believe it's workable. I mean, for the record, I agree with your stance, what you just described, which is I'm not for the two state solution, but that doesn't mean I actually have a workable solution. Yeah. If anyone had a workable solution or a simple solution, maybe we would get there. But I don't believe, and maybe in the past I did, I, I had my hopes and dreams that maybe it could work back when I was younger, even if I did believe in a two-state solution or at least giving it a crack, a fair crack, my position now is it's not workable. It's absolutely, <clears throat> and that's provable. They were given limited autonomy in certain places like Gaza, where we left. We withdrew from Lebanon. Anytime we withdraw or hand over jurisdiction, we're only met with terror. So let's, let's cut out the uh, delusion with all, what some people call it as yes. the, uh, the two-state delusion. And I, I agree with that. And again, I'm not an extremist. I'm very into peace. I'm very pro-Abraham Accords. I'm very pro-giving um, loyal Arab Israelis rights, more rights, investing in the infrastructure of their towns. They're, they're, they're partners with us. And I know many, by the way, Zionist uh, friends who are Israeli Arab. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, it's been painted as an extremist because you're against, and that, that unfortunately, as you're probably aware, is one of the attack points. The minute you oh. go against the two-state solution, you're attacked as an extremist, even though I consider myself as someone that is just paying attention to what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, always in this country, whenever anybody in the mainstream um, communal system refers to the Australian Jewish Association, it's always prefixed with the words, far right wing extremist so uh you can't you, you know you can't say anything without being labeled a far right wing extremist uh, as, 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 which is what we find so um no but i take your point david look um we'll wrap it up and i want to thank you so much for joining us um you do a wonderful job you as you say you're a you're a small uh, lone lone warrior um, but uh, we feel very, very much aligned with your views, and hopefully you you would probably like some of the, uh, like our views as well. So I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'll just remind people to go to the Israeli Cool uh, website. It's israelicool.com. Please, uh, please support the, uh, the website. David does a fantastic job. And uh, all power to you, David, and uh, we look forward to keeping in touch with you in future. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Alan, and the rest of the AJA gang. Thank you to all the people that took the time out tonight to, to listen to this and ask such thoughtful questions. And, um, yeah, I hope to see you all in Israel when you're here. Yep, yeah, well, we will look forward to it. Um, just before we go, um, the Lachaim program with Morris Klein is on right now. That's on 3ZZZ at FM 92.3 in Melbourne or 3 Z dot com dot au uh, elsewhere that's all we have for tonight next week don't forget we're doing a wrap up of 2022 and giving you the opportunity to uh, have your say um, you can keep up to date with what the aja is talking about on on our facebook page please like it and share it widely but for now we wish you all a very good evening and look forward to seeing you next week for our final session of the year so from me it's good night to you all and shalom david <laughs>